And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the man of a thousand navels, the man, the man, the man behind Ember, and and so and so many other projects, and the and the man who is is currently campaigning to have it to have his own floor just for mech suits. Absolutely. <laughs> good, good brother Kern. How are you doing today, man? I'm great, but brother Mildred, it's <laughs> nice to be back on the show in the monastery. Um. Now, uh, putting putting aside the putting aside the the fact that um that you know whenever people would bring up the whole winter is coming meme um with Game of Thrones, I would all I would always say that's not a meme, that's my life <laughs> because that's that's what's happening now. Um, it's probably going to get worse, but I'll just look at it and say, hey, free ammo. Oh, it sounds cold over there. Eh. It's not. It's not that cold. It's still. It's still in double digits. <laughs> okay. Um, there's. Well, at least it's double digits. It could be worse. That's true. Yeah. Um. Unless I'm all the way up in International Falls, but nobody goes up there. Um. But the. I get the feeling that if you that if you if you were if you ended up heading back to the Midwest for whatever reason, you'd end up reenacting that. That um that Calgary scene in Cool Runnings. No, they... Oh, I never, I actually never saw it. Um, they end up going, they 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 end up going to Calgary. They get their first blast of that cold air stepping out of the airport and run right back in and dr and dress in all the layers and and completely empty out the uh, luggage. <laughs> and their coach just looks at him like, "What's the matter? You guys cold?" That's true. I would be absolutely buried in. You know, quadruple, quintuple layers. Mm -hmm. You'd pro you'd probably be as Im you'd probably be as immobile as a guy in full plate. Yep, pretty much, mm -hmm. and I'd be happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, although, gi although given the com given the complaints I had to deal with with um, with Florida weather, I'm probably not one to talk. Mostly because oh. I was mostly because I was cosplaying, but. But I had the dumb idea of cosplaying in a three-piece suit, so yeah, never cosplay in a three-piece three-piece suit. I've looked into getting cool. I've looked into getting cooling vests. Next time I have to do that. Uh there are cooling suits. They sell mm -hmm. them for race car drivers yeah. and or people who want to be on the track. And I actually mm -hmm. looked into those because I I had to wear a fire suit when I was uh, doing some racing and it would get really hot. And so, yes, you can get those suits. Yeah. Um, well, at, the, at the very least, you, at the very least, you can say that you had a better career than Mahavir Ragunathan. Uh, sorry. I don't know him either. <laughs> he, um, he was a, he was a, he was a guy in, in, um, for, who had a brief stint in formula two. Um, ah, okay. But which, Formula Two is, for for all intents and purposes, it's the up and comers division. Like it's, the, okay. it's supposed to be the last step before you go before you go to the big boys. Um, but because of, like, because of the amount of penalty points he ended up getting, he um, ended up running him ended up running himself out to the point where no team will take him. Oh, jeez, yeah, that's no good. Yeah, I only watched a little bit of Formula One, and uh, and mostly this was just you know uh, hobby enthusiasts. I used to be a member of a track; we'd go yeah. out there, we'd race a lot. But yeah, so uh, that's a far cry from gaming, though. <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, even though even though everybody seems to have it seems to know my rep, know my know me by my tabletop stuff. It's not like I'm versed. I'm averse to dipping into uh, into other mediums because. Well, I do a whole lot of sport. I do a whole lot of sports shit posting, anyways. Um, uh, okay. And which is which has made me the which has made me the bane of 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 several fan bases in Los in Los Angeles and in da and in Dallas. Um, 
Mostly because I like picking on the Dodgers to the point where I say LA is an acronym for lost again. Oh yeah. That'll that'll start some things. Um or or um the or the fact that I've com- I've compared I've compared Dallas to the Toronto Maple Leafs because they both because they both act like they're God's gift to the sport and they haven't done anything in years. Mm. <laughs> With the Leafs, it's worse. They haven't done anything in fifty years. Yeah, unfortunately, I never got into sports mm-hmm. after moving to this country. Yeah. I mean, I tried, uh, but uh, several <laughs> let's just say several unfortunate events occurred, uh, <laughs> which turned me off of sports completely. Yeah. One involving a physical injury with a hockey puck, and the mm-hmm. other one uh, rooting for a team that lost several Super Bowls in a row. In a row, and they will <laughs> oh, not be named. God. They will not be named. I um. Now the puck one, I can I can understand that because I know how, because I know how th- things can get on the ice. Um, the the other story, you didn't even have to name it. I already figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. Yeah, I will never utter their name. <laughs> um, but now I do, now this is the part where I do have to go into a bit of, go into a bit of Chekhov's gun, and I did say you're going to have to answer for your crimes on this, Mark. Uh oh. Uh oh. I want you to explain to me why, in God's name, someone in your position is p- picked heavy gear over Mekton Zeta. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> this is this is going to get me in a lot of trouble because uh, I think I mentioned on Twitter that. <laughs> Um, Benjamin Wright is the, uh, one of the, the key designers mm-hmm. on Mekton and Bubblegum Crisis. And he was my DM in college, my GM for Cyberpunk 2020. Mm-hmm. And he, he used to draw all our characters cause he started off as an artist for Artas al Talsorian and the, he was freelance. So we would all get excited when the next source book came out. Cause Hey, our, our, our GM, you know, our, our game master's art is in here. And then he went on to work for the company and he. He designed Mekton mm-hmm. along with um, a couple other people. And, um, you know, it it really boiled down to something completely superficial. And you're like, well, gee, as a game designer, how could you do this? It's like, well, I, I liked the Mecha art and the layout of the Heavy Gear books more than the Mekton one. I thought the Mekton one, because it's a general system and it doesn't come with a universe, you know, you had mechas of all different styles and it just didn't grab me and I didn't get into it. And the only rules, and I didn't even read the rule set. The only real rules rule set I read was Heavy Gear, so I had nothing to compare it to. So when you asked me, I was like, well, the only one I got into and bought the books for even though I never got to play it, was Heavy Gear, and I did like their art style because it reminded me of Votoms. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, I do. Uh, I've, you know, Scope I've... Dog and everything else. Yeah, the the old anime, and I just loved that. So it was purely judging a book mm-hmm. by its cover. And But I Literally. have since bought the Mekton PDF mm-hmm. rules, and I started reading them the other night <clears throat> because, you know, in Ember, it's a, it's a mech game that we're mm-hmm. making, yeah. And I'm interested in uh, in how they approach different things. And Mekton, you know, is a very generalized system. You can, in fact, you role play the creation of your mech, right? And there's yeah. other players involved potentially. So I thought that was interesting. I was looking at different ways yeah. of of doing mech creation. So yes, uh, that was an uninformed tweet. Is the best <laughs> I can say, <laughs> based uh, purely on aesthetics, mm-hmm. which Benjamin's going to kill me for because you know I love his art. Uh, but in this case, I, I had to give it to Heavy Gear. Yeah, just it spoke to me more. Yep. And <laughs> for what for what it's worth, I en- I enjoy both, but I enjoy both for different reasons. Um, Heavy Gear does does tend to does tend to lean to that lower to, into into that um in, into that more grounded end end of things. Um, and for the um the thing the thing that does make a bit make things a bit tricky is some is the fact that. Sometimes the Shilouette system, which is what Heavy Gear uses, can be a little bit unforgiving. Um, like it, it, it gets borderline. L, it, 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 sometimes it can get borderline L five R levels of un, of unforgiving. Ooh, okay. Um, now, fortunate, fortunately, some a and I'm, I may uh, send you this later, but. A fan did do a full conversion of Heavy Gear to the West End D6 rule set. Okay. 
um, and put and put out the whole thing for free. Well, obviously, Wait, West, West End D six is that what Twilight two thousand or no? Um, that's uh, okay. st- that's uh, Star Wars. Oh, the Star Wars is okay. I have played Star Wars. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, although 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 it's funny you mentioned Twilight two thousand since that's coming back. Is it really? Yeah, and of all people to be bringing it back, it's being brought back by Free League. Huh, okay. If I recall, that's a pretty complicated system, though. Yeah, the... Um, what they're going to be doing is a slight... It, the, version that they're, the version that they're bringing back isn't using the original rules, because, to be honest, um, the original Twilight 2000 was in that, was in that 90s high-crunch style that even that even I'm not a big fan of um yep I mean I, I I like I liked it's one of those it's one of those things where there's just too many charts um yes there were many 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 charts mm-hmm. I remember but, it's one of those rule books I had mm-hmm. and then you thumb through it and you'd be like I don't know how to play this and I don't know how I'm gonna play this and if I'm, and I play a, I've played a fair amount of role master and hero. So if I'm saying a game has too many charts, then you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when but what they're doing is a modified version of the of the uh, Year Zero engine that they've used for Alien, Mutant Year Zero, and um, Forbidden Lands. Mm-hmm. Um, so I ha- and in the interest of disclosure, I will note that I backed it on Kickstarter. Um, okay. I have a. It's I have a. I main I'm I'm the main reason why I did why I'm keeping a clo- why I'm keeping a close eye on it is because Free League has yet to put out a bad game in their lineup. Hmm. Um. It, whether it, whether it be through them directly or or through the um pu- or through the publishing uh, um third part of third party material like say Mork Borg. Which. I'm actually proud that the guys who behind that um, got nominated for a graphic design award, a legit graphic design award in Sweden. Oh, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. That's um, awesome. But so do they make beautiful books? Is um, what you're saying? They make good. They they make well designed book. They make well designed books. Um, as far as far as calling it beautiful, I don't know if I'd go that route because. The best way to well, describe you... it is the best way to describe Morkborg is old school D and D meets Doom meets um Doom and black metal, Swedish black metal. Uh, okay. Well, there's an interesting combo. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I wanted to ask you a question. How do you do you like to collect books that are aesthetically pleasing? You know, we talked about how mm-hmm. I gravitated towards heavy gear because the mm-hmm. layout at the time was really snazzy. Uh. Like, do you, do you do that? And what's your what? What do you think is one of the most beautiful? Even I'm not talking about how it plays, but what's mm-hmm. like one of the most beautiful books, rule books that you've seen? Um, no, I de- I I can definitely say that I do, and there's and there's definitely books whose um whose layout or or aesthetic or art style has um appealed to me. Um, I will freely admit that's how I ended up finding out about Anima because I'm a big fan of um. Of Wen Yu Li's art style, who's one who, you know, you know how there's, you know how there are certain franchises whose whose um visual style is represented by a certain artist, like say, um, Yoshitaka Amano is with Final Fantasy, or um, Akira Toriyama is with Dragon Quest. Mm-hmm. Wen yep. Yu Li, who's known as Wen M on DeviantArt, is that for anima. Like his, it was his style that got me into that into that setting, um, and the same thing went with um, Exalted Second Edition. And the reason why I didn't go with um, Third is because for to to get it to get their visual identity for Second Edition Exalted, they hired Udon and Imaginary Friends. Oh yes, really great concept houses. Yeah. And they and they did so, they did some amazing uh, they did some amazing art for that for that um, and it's 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 when it's when someone ha- it's when there's a consistent visual style that that'll always appeal to me and as far as far as as far as one of my fa- as far as one of my favorites in that regard um, even the even though the even though the um, 
even though I would... There's a couple examples I can think of because it's a, it's a two-way tie, and both of them I'm not entirely sure if I'd be willing to run these days. Um, one, of, one of them is Aorus Essence, um, which I do, I, do think I, I do think I sent a copy of that to you a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, mm-hmm. really beautiful. Yeah, and I've, I've had, I've had the guy behind but, it on but the. Some, mm-hmm. But sometimes the text is unreadable because it's on a lush background and. Yeah, um, the guy, the guy behind that, the guy behind that has dr- has drifted over into doing um, into doing novels. But a lot of a lot of some of the motifs that he had about spiritualism, um, mm-hmm. are still are still maintained even with even with the not the uh, novel series that he's writing. Um, second place would go to Alpha Omega, which was developed as a game that was developed in the er, in the um, late two thousands, early twenty tens, by Mindstorm Labs, who unfortunately just disappeared one day, and nobody's been able to find where they where they are. They they um. Putting aside the fact that that having having a um having a a more landscape like for, like page format is gonna is gonna make you stick out both literally and figuratively, the books <laughs> because the books are sticking out of my shelf, but <laughs> by a bit, um and I don't I don't like the whole put I don't like the whole idea of put it in sideways. You know because right. then you ju- then you just can't see it, um. But I really, I really enjoyed the cons- the consistency of its particular style. Um, of course, the of course the main thing that I'll get on anybody for is having an index. Like, you've got you've got you've got to have you. I need to have that if I'm de- if I'm dealing with somebody's book. There's no excuse for that now. I mean, back when this all started, indexes had to be manually compiled mm-hmm. and books were being changed and everyone was doing layouts with rubber cement and scissors and paste ups, right? Mm-hmm. But now there's no excuse because you can generate indexes automatically with you know tools in Word or anything else or your layout software. I, I just don't, right? There's no mm-hmm. excuse not to have an index now. Um. I will. Uh, the only ex- the only real exception that I make is for smaller books. Like if your book is say fifty pages or less, I'm not going to get on you as hard. Um, but if if say if say um Hero Games put out and put out a expansion for um Hero System Sixth Edition, and it was and it was the size of one of their normal books, and it didn't have an index, I would be as- I would be demanding people's heads on spikes. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Now the guy, the guy behind um, Fragged Empire, which is actually pretty good and has a ve- and has a very striking um, visual style, uh, mostly because mostly because the guy involved is both is both the writer and the artist, which is pretty which in tabletop gaming is pretty rare. Yeah. Um. Sp- um. Wade Wade Dyer, who's a fr- who is a friend of the temple? Um, he doesn't put in an index, but he does put a very comprehensive bookmark and hyperlink set set up in his books. Um, and he he knows that he knows that I've roasted him on this, <laughs> but but um that's that's his de- that's that's been his defense when it comes to not doing it. And um, I've contested that yeah that that's nice, but it ultimately means that your book is skewed towards digital and um. If you're gonna do that, don't put out a physical release. I uh, I mostly get uh, digital now, mm-hmm. just because of space reasons. But then when I find a digital that I like, then I'll be like, okay, I'll allocate shelf space to it, and I'll go order the soft cover or the hard cover yeah. rule set. Um, I, I like having hard cover, mm-hmm. and and you know I've been. I've been playing 5e recently, running a campaign with my my kids and some friends, mm-hmm. and I've been using D and D Beyond. And unfortunately, I find searching that app on the iPad to be horrendous. And I've I've complained to them many times about it. <laughs> and they've made some improvements, but that's that's probably the most frustrating thing I've been trying to do is to mm-hmm. look up rules digitally in that app and i'm like yeah. just give me a pdf you know um 
and if, there, if there's one person uh, who's search the, functionality if there's one person who i'd say is the king of um of P, of pdf especially when it comes to reading his stuff on an on an on say an ipad it's mm -hmm. christian nome um who did who did a uh, camp who did a campaign setting for savage worlds called titan effect okay the best way the best way for me to describe titan effect in in a sentence is imagine x-men meets metal gear solid with a little bit of Mission Impossible sprinkled in. Okay, <laughs> that's that's a unique setting. But he had, but the way he's the way he set it up is the way he set up the um, the PDF is that if you were reading it on say a tablet, he had the hype he had the hyperlinks in the chapter sections set up as if you were as if you were looking at it on a data pad for the organization that the player characters are a member of called Spear. Oh, that's kind of neat. So it was mm -hmm. themed. Yeah. Um, and he's he's shown he's shown a few examples of, of this kind of thing on his um, art station page. And that and that sort that sort of theming is really really rare. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's funny you mentioned D and D because do you remember the last time that I had you on? I I talked about there being I talked about the potential for a schism. With how people, um, with how these the whole simplified rule set that it that it both it was um was going to run into a situation where people were going to be asking for that sandbox to expand. Right. Well, I don't like to brag, <laughs> but a few but two months afterwards, En World decides that this announces that they're working on a advanced five e book called. Um, tentatively called Level Up. Ah. <laughs> it's doing exactly that. Doing expanded. It's an expanded version of the of the player's handbook. Doing remixes of all of all the classes and giving just more period when it comes to the sandbox. Like like what sort of stuff are we talking about? DM campaign oriented stuff, or are you and. And wilderness tables and things like this, or are we talking about changes to and additions to core combat and to uh, spells and class abilities and, and things like this? Yes, all of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, right now, right now, right now, they've been focusing on te on testing expanded version of individual classes, which may, which makes sense because that's going to be that's the easiest way to give people a idea of of what the plan is well is and, that a, is that a okay but is that necessarily a bad thing i mean you predicted mm -hmm. it but you know for people who mm -hmm. want a little more mm -hmm. you know what's wrong with offering an advanced version of the rule set yeah. um i'm i'm only i'm only laughing at the, at the fact that i um I had I had felt that you're gonna see you're gonna see I felt that because I had I had said that you're gonna see some sort of um, not necessarily a fifth edition but a five point five and I and I didn't know and um, I ended up being right sooner than I thought I was because I figured I wouldn't see that for at least until at least twenty twenty one. Um. I didn't ex I didn't expect that to s I didn't expect to see that in um er in early spring was when, was right, when so I'm going to put you on the spot. How do you think they're going to sell? How do you think they're going to do? Do you think there's a demand for this kind of thing or do you think it's going to be really really niche or non-existent? I think there I think there is going to be a demand. And to get to to explain why I, w I will have to, I will have to go a bit of a bit into what, I, what I've been doing for the last few months because there have been a handful of five e of five e settings who I've interviewed the people working on them, and a pattern I've noticed with a lot of them is that they are, tr and this is a pattern I've noticed for for about two years, possibly more, where they are trying to ex trying to expand the um trying to expand the sandbox whether it be the Spheres of Power, Spheres of Might, um, Fifth Edition expansion, which is a complete reworking of how of how spellcasting works. Instead of it being um, instead of it being every class has a spell list, it relies on a talent based system. Um, they had done this previously with Pathfinder, and it's actually really really good with the amount of stuff that you can do because of the fact that not only do 
not only do you have these um, casting talents, but it's it's more of a case of like I'll I'll use I'll use the good old let's use the good old fireball. Like somebody ca somebody casts a fireball and they've got a certain amount of those per day, and it's a very fire and forget thing. But the way this talent system works out, if you take the fire sphere, that'd give you a fireball like effect that would co that would cost a certain number of spell points. You could eventually get more talents to do more things with that fireball, like being able to launch multiple ones, being able to make a bigger one, being able to make one that doesn't miss, and so on. Okay, and so you can basically tailor the spells based yeah. on your talents. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing that they added was what's known as casting traditions, is in order to in order to kind of solve the whole problem of having of having every spellcaster cast the same way, you can do casting traditions so that the rules for spellcasting aren't static. Um, in their Pathfinder version, they they did a build of Bakugo from My Hero Academia, okay. and one and part of what they did with casting traditions was that. Instead of relying on spell points, um, casting induces fatigue because it's a natural effect, like a like a um, like using a muscle, but overuse is going to be taxing. That's one. That's one. That's one possibility. It's you're basically allowed. It basically is a means to allow you to put um, benefits and drawbacks in a kind of one for two basis. So okay. so the GM can tailor what. A certain spellcaster can and can't do with how their magic is supposed to work. So this all feels, you know, like three point five on steroids, basically. Um, they are they are simplifying the they are simplifying the approach with um, with it, and it de it definitely is taking a taking the whole meta magic thing and running with it. And I'm vastly simpl simplifying the simplifying the matter, of course. That's just one example. Then there's then there's been. There's been um been different been stuff like Nightfell, which is doing which is doing a more doing a more horror themed approach and ch and changing the rules to suit to suit its um setting. Um, a week a week ago, I talked with the developer of the Fading Embers, who was doing this Frozen Apocalypse kind of thing and and change and changes the rule set so that um a lot of fire magic just isn't possible. Um, and there, and it's one of those things where when I see a lot, I see a lot of this sort of, sort of stuff in the third, in the third party end of, um, D of D and D with people, with people doing alternate systems or alternate class styles or, and the like. And that's why, that's why I think there is a demand for expanding the sandbox. The other, re the other major reason I say this is the psionics incident from earlier this year. Oh, what's that? That sounds like drama. Um, now, fortunately, this isn't as mentally retardation as the whole orc debate, which I don't which I don't acknowledge because it was fucking <laughs> stupid. Yes, it was. But what you're familiar with? You're familiar with um, the unearthed arcana PDS, right? Uh, I know Unearthed Arcana, but why do you say PDFs? Um, they ha when they want when Wizards wants to test out things that they might put in future books, they release them as these free PDFs under the under the Unearthed Arcana series. Okay. Uh. Okay. So now, you're not talking about the original Unearthed Arcana book. You're no. talking about like these are like uh, experimental rules, sort of like what Dragon Magazine used to be. Yeah. Right. Where they would come out with different mm -hmm. rule sets by guest authors, and some of them would make their way in. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Now, with now, the the um, they they um had one PDF that was going to be dedicated to adding um, psionics and psychic powers into the into D and D. But they ended up causing a bit of a stir because they because they um. First off, they instead of instead of introducing a psionic a psionic class, which one would which one would expect because that's been the precedent for thirty years. Mm -hmm. Instead, they made they made three subclasses and they tried to advance the argument of 
a psionic is just a wizard who casts spells with his mind. This oh. went poorly. This went very poorly. I don't like that <laughs> idea at all. And um, um, one, one of the brothers of the temple, um, James Streisand, a.k.a. Ash of Creativity, ended up making the seer class just, out of, just to show how you're supposed to do this kind of thing. Eventually they took eventually they took it down and redid it. But there ha but I have noticed a growing frustration with ha with the fact that Wizards of the Coast is extremely paranoid about the idea of exp of expanding 5 ed um 5th edition sandbox to the point where they were they would rather just add more um subclasses instead of adding a full on class. The only major time in the last five years that they've added a new class was the, was the artificer in the um in the fifth edition Eberron book. Right. I have that book. Mm -hmm. Eberron's one of my favorite settings. Yeah, so. I I like Eb I like Eberron, especially since I I'll always I'll always be down for a little for a little bit of steampunk. Um. But the but. There are, but there were some, there were several classes that were, um, that were full-on classes in previous editions that were made into subtypes of other classes. Um, one of the big, one of the big ones for me that stu that stuck in my craw was making um, blade singers a subtype of wizard, which I felt okay. was counter, I felt was counterproductive because the idea of something like a blade slinger, blade, um, blade singer is. They're a they're a um so they're a, they're a fencer who no who dabbles in magic. They're a gish. Mm -hmm. And yep, the thing with doing subclasses is it's a case of lipstick on a pig. You can say you can say oh it, oh it's oh it's changing it so that so that it has some melee capacity. But the problem is, in that case, it's still going to end up playing like a wizard. Yep. And. The the psychic thing is the psychic thing is the one that really stuck in my craw because um, psionics and magic have always had a apples to oranges attitude with the fact that psionics are meant to be a lot more freeform with how they utilize points. Like psychic effects are not fire and forget. Right. And because I don't think they should be. I think psionics needs to be more about. A contest of wills, mental fortitude, mm -hmm. you know, mental exhaustion, yeah. uh, you know, that all that type of flavor, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's just reduced to spells, you're, you're just a mage with extra steps. You know? <laughs> yeah, they tr they tried to when they when they brought when they brought back the psionics things back, they tried to introduce a resource called called psionic die, and um, that ties that ties into another thing where. I think I think wait I think way too many um, classes in in five E's design are um are reliant on using some are relying on using some sort of point um point resource to make them interesting when there's mm. other ways to do it whether it be and so and some sometimes you end up ca in cases like say warlocks or sorcerers you end up double stacking on gimmicks and it kind of reminds me of a problem that I had when um. Because I, I mentioned this the last time I had you on, why I why I um left, wow, because yep. because the because um too many classes were get were were becoming were becoming multi role but single role classes didn't have anything to compensate. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I look I look at say I look at say monks with key, with with key putting um subclasses aside or. Warlocks with invocations or sorcerers with meta with meta magic and the points with and the points therein, and I end up thinking, what do you give? What are you giving for the fighter outside of his subclass when it comes to this sort of thing? Right. Like, and since previous editions actually addressed this, that's why the this whole oh five e is this greatest hits of the editions I find weak. Okay. It's, I see that. Mm -hmm. So, so the schism has occurred, as yeah. you, as you predicted, and there are those who want 
more rules for 5e, more advanced rules, and mm-hmm. then those who just want the core. And not necessarily a bad thing, but, uh, you know, but maybe the way that... that uh, I want to ad- I want to advance something with you, and this is something I've been think this is something I've been thinking about since two thousand five. Do you th- do you think that d- do you think that D and D would be better would be better served returning to the basic advanced format? What do you mean by the basic advanced format? Um, in how in the how in the past you had you had base you had basic D and D for the, for those who wanted the more the more straightforward approach, and then you had mm-hmm. for people who wanted a bit more in depth um, crunch, um, advanced. I I I actually like that idea, mm-hmm. um, and it's one that I've been thinking of for uh, my own tabletop uh, Gate Striders, um, where. You know, I'm struggling with this kind of like, uh, hey, let's just get into it. Let's just do fast play. Uh, even, even, I would say AD and D first edition is is actually pretty simple. You know, all things considered. Mm-hmm. Uh, second edition, you know, starts to get into more, and then 3.5, of course, you know, blows up into a lot of customization and yeah. and maxing. Um, but I like that idea. I like the idea that there is a streamlined system that you can just play and you can make that uh, very DM oriented. Hey, the DM mm-hmm. can do the rules and the campaign's very open and everything's sort of uh, customizable. And then, you know, I do understand the, the players that many players love to get into very deep progression paths mm-hmm. with their characters that allow them to tune them in, in very different ways. Uh, and, and in broken ways. I mean, part of the fun is finding <laughs> how to make a broken class that just like you know is is completely overpowered. And, and players, you know, Dave Williams, who designed L five R, used to tell me that he liked to build in those paths because it made players feel clever and smart mm-hmm. and rewarded them for finding it. Yeah. And um, and so yeah, I, I see I see room for that. So. You know, and that's something that I've been seriously considering. Although for Gate Striders, although in a different way, I was thinking that in Gate Striders, there would be a basic table, uh, basic uh, tabletop role playing game that would mainly be in theater of the mind, mm-hmm. and then there would be a because we're a spaceship game, right? So every every player's got their own spaceship, and you can mm-hmm. fly around. And then I thought maybe there would also be a more like you know. Uh, board game approach, like say Gloomhaven, right? Yeah. That you could take with it, and that type of split is interesting to me, especially mm-hmm. since some players really you know, and board games in, are not exactly advanced because they have more rigid rule sets, right? But wait, board uh, games I, are not are not that much advanced. Have you pl- have you played Axis and Allies? Oh, okay. Never, <laughs> all right. <laughs> that was the wrong word. <laughs> Open ended in their rules. Yeah. Okay. Oh. The, the, board games are not generally open-ended in their rules they mm-hmm. can have a lot of complexity but this is the complexity you get Boom. yeah and uh you know and 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 that's what it is uh so yeah uh, that duality is very interesting mm-hmm. to me and i and i actually think that you know i like playing D mm-hmm. in theater of the mind yeah. i like you know um rewarding players for coming up with cool moves like in, mm-hmm. in 5e we were playing and and my son decided to do a sneak uh, he they were imprisoned in a cell and he wanted to do a sneak and steal the the crossbow of a guard that was that was aiming at him mm-hmm. and that was aiming at the party and then he kind of pulled his john wick move and we made up a bunch of you know roles and challenges mm-hmm. for that and that was fun yeah and and when when you but that won't, doesn't happen as readily if i'm moving miniatures around on a map yeah and uh, so I I, I, I kind of see the like the aspects of both, but then I kind of like when I think about spaceship battles, I really like the idea of space spatial relationships being important mm-hmm. for spacecraft, and so I really wanted like a set of rules that let me push these three D printed miniatures because our plan is to have three uh, D files that you can download for free and print and have mm-hmm. your own miniatures. No more buying this stuff. I mean, you can buy it if you like from us, but you can also just print them if you like. Yeah. Um, you know, and screw games workshop. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can, so, I can definitely, I can definitely say, I can definitely uh, say that. Give, especially, give, especially given that they had, they had, they they put they put out a they put out a kick ass cha- um, 
Chaplin, Space Marine, and Terminator armor, but, oh, it's a limited release for Warhammer Day. It's like, fuck you, man. Just fuck you. Yep. Um, thank, thank God, I, thank God I, focus, I focus on Cubicle 7 putting out the RPG so I don't have to deal with that shit. Um, <laughs> well, well, what about you? Do, you? do you think there's merit in going back to that sort of system? And that's kind of what we're seeing now, although it's third party, right? With 5e Honest, with this latest release. Honestly, yes. Because there because there there is a precedent both in the past and the present for this kind of thing. Um, now when it came to that when you mentioned board when you mentioned um, dipping into board games a, a bit with what with what you said with Gloomhaven, um, yep. something that immediately came to mind to me was the was Nighthawks in um, in the old Star Frontiers game. Which is which I consider oh. one Star for what it's worth, I consider Star Frontiers and along along with the Saga system to be two of the most underrated entries from TSR's library. I had the mm-hmm. box Star Frontier set, and I couldn't get anyone to play with me because they only wanted fantasy. Yeah. But yeah, um, in fact, I want to get it on on eBay. I want to find a good copy because uh, I actually found an old copy of Top Secret from TSR, and I snagged that right away. I just like collecting um, the. Was it to- was ancient. it Top Secret or Top Secret SI? Oh, let me. You know what? I I don't remember. Let me check. <laughs> As, top Secret SI is effectively speaking the second edition. Oh no! This is the the OG. Top. All right. Um, in more in more recent times, um, there there's obvious there's a simplified version of Fate called Fate Accelerated. Um, which is something I find amusing because Fate is a pretty is a pretty light game as it is. Um, and there and there's been and um, there's been a, there there's there's the there's been a, there's oh no been it a, is SI it is uh, second edition sorry okay I just saw it yeah um and there and there's been there's been um uh, there's been other att- other attempts at making um at making stream at making streamlined versions um i think i i think at one point i saw a um a a um, streamlined version of hero system which um that's a that's a monumental task if i ever heard one <laughs> try, try, i think it was i think it was like i think it was meant to be like a light version of hero system 6th edition i think um but I, no matter what edition of hero system you're trying to, you're trying to li- you're trying to lighten your um you're going to be cl- you're going to be making an uphill climb regardless um and there and um there's been there's been there's been plenty of there's been plenty of other in, of other instances of trying to trying to do a um skimmed down version i i once found a a there's a free rpg called mini 6 that is a diet version of the d6 system from west end games now that that now that um that system is open license okay um I have the I have the I have the printed version and the thing's only like thirty two or so, thirty two or so pages compared compared to the hundred and fifty that each book in the D six Trinity was. Um. The, so the, so there is there is most there is most definitely a precedent. I can I can see why some people would be hesitant to it because it because it would mean having to having to um having to split, but. When you consider how like starter sets work for a lot of RPGs, it's 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 not too it's not too hard to imagine. Um, and I'd say I'd say if you if theoretically if I were to split um, fifth edition into into a basic and advanced version, mm-hmm. the thing that I would the thing that I would probably end up doing is is making it so, is making it so that the only the only thing you really need to add on when it comes to basic is just modules. Um, because though because most D and D modules are going to be pretty self contained as it is, right? Um, although I do, although I should note that I I don't particularly care for um fifth edition's approach to its expansion material of just throw all the shit in the book, with you you know with with things like um the, how do you mean um. 
well to well to put to put it in comparison i want i want to reference i want to reference how how um, expansions can how expa how first party expansions kind of worked in third and fourth edition i know i, I know every i know it's haram for me to for me to bring up fourth edition but honestly i don't care okay um but when when it came to when it came to a third when it came to a when it came to a third edition book if you picked up Sword and Fist for third edition, or Complete Warrior for three point five. You knew exactly what you were getting. It was going to be it was going to be an expansion themed around martial classes, Ad, right. adding in adding in some adding in some extra feats, prestige classes, classes, and so on. And unfortunately, the Complete Warrior Samurai class, which nobody likes. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, if uh, with fourth with um fourth edition. If I pick up um, Primal Power, it is going to be an expansion for um, character for character classes that utilize the Primal Power Source: Druids, Shamans, wa um, Wardens, and so on. What if I pick up um, Xanathar's Guide to Everything? Oh, what's that? Um, if if I pick up Xanathar's Guide to Everything with, for um, Fifth Edition. Right. What is it? What is it going to? T what is that book going to tell me about what it's going to focus on? Uh, it's a bit of everything, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and e even with and with um, I it's one of those things where I w I would much r I would much rather it do the it do. You do a book, a book for martial heroes, a, a book for arcane heroes, set and, and so on for for players, and get and doing themed expansions for for GMs as well. Um, yeah, I mean, Panther's Guide to Everything that does include additional rules, so it's sort mm -hmm. of like you've got classes, you've got advanced rules, and it'd be nice if they were consolidated and and split into more manageable themes, right? Yeah. I, I think that's an aspect of growth that they, like you said, the, their growth strategy wasn't clear to them, and they were just kind of, I think, riffing it as they went along, and so you end up with some stuff here and some stuff there, to the point where if they did an advanced set of rules, uh, it'd be kind of difficult because they've got advanced rules sprinkled out through the books. Yeah, I th I. Th I honestly, I honestly think the, I honestly think it's a case of over, of um, like a lot, like a lot of issues that I, that I've had with fifth edition's development, overcompensation. Because, mm -hmm. it's well, it's well known how how um really out of hand the customization got with um third with third edition, and. While fourth edition did not have as much out of hand customization, everybody still believes certain straw mans with fourth edition. So they so they want to get as far away from both of those as possible. The problem with that is the pendulum swings both ways. If you went if if go if um and but and by trying to have it that you that every that all roads lead to the the core three books, or um, or ha or having it where, you where um you don't where um you don't have a you don't have a clear web of expansion because you because you don't want to because the mere idea of expanding into the level of um of three of three point five is insanity. Is um is is to and run away from that running run if you run away from that to the opposite direction you end up with just trading one problem for another. Mm -hmm. I think it's a I think it's a case where they didn't where they didn't think that far ahead. And the funny thing is, when it because when because whenever people whenever people bring up the customization thing with three point five they bring up feats obviously where there were like. I think I think like seventeen thousand feats at the end of the day. <laughs> there are a lot, and so many of those feats were traps because Monty Cook was a bit of a dickhead at that point. <laughs> if that sounds harsh, he, keep in mind that, that keep in mind that at that time he had said that system mastery should be encouraged and system ignorance should be punished. 
a yeah. view, a viewpoint. He sends he sends he, back he, off he of so, that. Oh well, yeah, by a by a um, several miles. Mm -hmm. I guess he figured out what sells better, right? <laughs> oh, I think I think it, I think it's also the fact that hit that um that particular mindset wouldn't work at all with the, his current baby, which is the cipher system. Yep. But no, cipher is very streamlined. Oh yeah, it is, and I, I absolutely, I absolutely love, I've loved the cipher system since I grabbed um, Numenera, and mm -hmm. when the Strange came around, I figured it's only a matter of time before it goes Universalist, and then it did. Um. But these, but the thing, the thing is, when it comes to when it comes to having having feats, but at, in a three point five level of complexity, but not going overboard. Um, someone already did that. Crafty Games did with Fantasy Craft and Spycraft. Right. I played a lot of Spycraft, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, 1.0 or 2.0? Because 1.0, they didn't really hit their stride. Uh, you know, I don't remember. Probably yeah. both. I probably... Because I, I ran several campaigns, mm -hmm. and, uh, and but this was a long time ago. Yeah. But we probably up updated the rules at some point. Yeah. Um, Spycraft... Spycraft 1.0 is not it wasn't bad but it but um compared to 2.0 it's it's 2.0 was a massive step above cuz that was it's cuz with 1.0 they were still operating within the within the um D20 sandbox a bit 2.0 and Fantasy Craft was when they started blowing up that sandbox and rebuilding from the ground up right and in particular how they handled feats to the point where you don't to the point where if I create a class for either of those games, I don't have to write out whether or not a class counts as a bonus feat for a, for a given class. I can just write, oh, okay. When you get a bonus feat, you can you can pick between the, you can pick between these categories, and then I'm done. And mm -hmm. most of and ninety nine percent of the feat chains in Spycraft and Fantasy Craft are just three are just three tier chains with no with no really um. No, no real excessive um, requirements beyond that. Like, there's no instance of you remember whirlwind strike from 3.5 and all the absurd mm -hmm. requirements you needed to, to just do a spinning strike like your like your link. <laughs> yes. Like you, yep. you needed a certain base attack bonus. You needed spring attack. You needed do you needed dodge. <laughs> yes. To the point where you you probably in order to get it you needed to plan out what you're going to do for every level for up right right at the um, start. Mm hmm. Yes. Yep. And yeah, you know a lot of games are mm -hmm. that way. And it, it, even old computer games mm -hmm. were like that. And you have you need online calculators to plan out your route. Eve Online. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to get from point A to point B. Here's your online calculator. Go figure yeah. it out. Yep. Um. You know, I I would make a joke about e about Eve Online being a being a um, spreadsheet game, but then I played Aurora. Mm. I never played Aurora. Um, it is very impressive that it is um, Aurora Four X is very impressive for being made by only one guy, but um, you're you're going to be looking at menus a lot. <laughs> okay. And it's and because of look there, there if you look at if you look at a lot of space 4x games there's a reason why they don't use a why they don't like using very bright colors a lot and why is that because you're going to be staring at the screen for quite a while because nobody plays it nobody nobody spends a few minutes playing a 4x game <laughs> like you you look at say Stellaris you 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 look at um you you look at endless endless space, which is my personal favorite um, space 4x these days. You look at you you uh, look you look at master you look at master of Orion and and so on. Very d very dark colors, not um, specks of brightness, but nothing but but an emphasis on cool coloring instead of warm color. Yep. And the and um it's be it's because you're going to be staring at that screen even um. Even more, le even so something like Civilization doesn't really do a whole lot of bright colors. 
Sure. Because because they, because um doing that for doing when you consider that you're dealing with a kind of game that wants you to sit there for hours or sometimes days because one more because of the one more turn curse um it does it doesn't want it it doesn't want to give players eye strain unless the developer is a sadist mhm mm but yeah. you but um aurora 4x is very very specific when it when it comes to its mechanics so that that's why I kind of up that kind of, that's why I kind of upstaged Eve as the spreadsheet sim. Okay. At the at the very least at the very least I don't have to worry about link ships anymore. Mm-hmm. Because fuck whoever decided that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I yeah I I I thought that Eve was going to be an uphill battle, but it just got, when it launched because we were we were talking to the devs while we were working on WoW and they mm -hmm. were like asking me what I thought, and I said, this is really hardcore. I mean, even at the time, you know, just, just docking was hardcore. They did, they did, it was, they did, they did fix that. But, um, but yeah, so, and I, I really didn't think it was going to take off. I have to admit, I was totally surprised when I got this very hardcore and substantial enough following to, to be very profitable for the company and to drive the game forward. I guess it just yeah. goes to show you that there is a crunch crowd, and mm -hmm. if you make a game for the crunch crowd, they will embrace it. Yeah, I mean, um, even with all the, even with all the insanity, people people are still willing to dive into the um, grand strategy games that Paradox puts out. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely mm -hmm. an audience for that. So. Yeah. Getting back to the ori the original point earlier in the cast, it's like, yeah, there is room for advanced rules, and there's players that'll that'll totally eat that up. So yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, now, so, oh, go ahead. When it com when it comes to when um some something that I was a bit curious about since you mentioned WoW because um I mentioned that my intro my introduction wasn't through the game but through through the video game per se but through the um, board games, um, did it were was the were any of the were any of the um board games or 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 the like um ever brought up at the office? Yeah, usually <laughs> we we didn't have uh. I don't know. That was a thankless job. Some designer would draw the last straw and have to be the sort of go-between with the with the board game creators, right? And mm -hmm. nobody wanted that job. Everyone wanted to work on the video game. And we had had a lot of prior bad experiences with that. And so there was a lot of moaning and groaning about, you know... Um, you know Were uh, people literally drawing straws to see who was, was going to be making that call? not literally but it felt like that it felt like you know whichever designer got assigned to that um it was just like extra work mm -hmm. and depending on who it was that was making it and who you got as your partner and mm -hmm. designer was either going to be a good experience or just a really bad one and so nobody was excited nobody was excited about uh the board games to be honest uh they just kind of came out mm -hmm. uh there would be a couple copies in the office and we never played them i mean they're probably excellent I don't know. I never was a liaison with uh, a board game company for this stuff, um, but we never, we never really looked at them. No, yeah. um, I, I, I had gone, I had gone through a few of them. Um, the majority of the, the majority of the stuff, the majority of the board game stuff that I dealt with was the stuff that Fantasy Flight Games was putting out, who have a very strong reputation for putting out high quality material. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The WoW board game was an absolute monster. Um, it was not in the sense that it was a bad game. It was just it was just really big, and that's before the um, two expansions that they put out, um, Shadow mm -hmm. of War and um, and Burning Crusade. Um, yep. Then they did a simplified version called the Adventure Game, which um, did get a handful of expansions, but they were expansions of just more just more characters. Um. It wasn't better or worse. It was just different. At the very least, it didn't take me as long to set up. Um, like the the original WoW board game that took that that would take me a while to set up, and um, 
that's it's one of those setups where you're you're going to be in for you're going to be in for this game for several hours kind of thing right um i did delve a little bit into the card game which was made by upper deck the um i'd say that was the weakest entry simply because it was trying i think it was trying to do too much at once i i really th I, I think a straight up Warcraft card game would have better chances than a World of Warcraft card game, if you follow me. Um, no, I don't. What what to you in your mind is the fundamental difference? Um The fundamental difference is the is the fact that with a with some with something like World of Warcraft, obviously you're there's going to be an, there's going to be a bit of emphasis on this on this one on this one character that you're that you're going to be playing as, and obviously you can't make a character for a card game, in that sense. But mm -hmm. um, oh, I see what you're th saying. There's the fact that that each of each of those is going to have a class, which means it's going to have to have um, abilities t abilities tied to that, and at the same at the same time they try to implement a quest system as well within within the card game which um which is is something that FFG managed to do with Warhammer Invasion but trying to do it in a T in a TCG um with, with um ends up resulting in having divided attentions because obviously the obviously with a card game you're going to want to try and have the best advantage you can over your opponent but with trying to add a quest system to that, um, while still while still trying to follow some degree of the magic formula, you and en you end up with um, of divided experience. The reason why I say I think I think a Warcraft um, card game would have been better off is you do that you can just theme it around one around one of the ra around one of the races. And you can already set up you can already set up units, resources, effects around that, and it'd be e and it'd be easier to manage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think you're right. It'd be a different type of game. Now, that's, that's you... not to say card games focused on a single hero can't work, um, but they have to be built expressly around that exclusively. Can't do both. Right. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll agree with that. Um. And I think trying to straddle it, straddling straddling types of games is always a risky business. Yeah, I'd. Would you say it? Would you say it more often than not? It's a case of too many cooks in the kitchen. No, it, it can be one designer <laughs> who just wants to to throw everything in the kitchen sink into a system. Yeah. You know, um, it, I mean, that happens a lot. Yeah, I, we, um... we, we get so many ideas, and and it's really about focus and throwing away the non essential ideas. I think in I think in that regard I'm I'm guessing that it's best to have some it's best to have someone who's willing who's willing to say no that's not going to work. It's it, but it's not one person. We have a lot of meetings and there's a lot of uh you know uh, spirited debate and uh but usually you know is that we, is that a is that a fancy California way of saying shouting at people? Sometimes <laughs> But we would all leave as, as, as we would all leave as friends, you know. Mm -hmm. I I don't think it ever got that, you know. If if it if it did get acrimonious, it, it was only because people wanted the best for the game. Mm -hmm. And when we left the room, uh, you know, everyone felt like they were able to present their case as forcefully as they mm -hmm. liked, and the decision was made, and we all got behind the decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, you know, and that dis decision would stand until it hit players, and then we realized we were all wrong and have to do it over again. <laughs> so, yeah. Um when now when it come now um when it comes to when it come, when it comes to the when it comes to those 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 sort of things I a a key ex, a key example that always that there's two key examples that always come to mind because I like to I like to look at um the the games that um ended up backfiring and what and what can we learn from the experience so mm -hmm. there's two examples I can think of of games that, in my opinion at least, did did um tried to tried to couldn't figure out what it was trying to do to begin with. Um, one of them was the, was the infamous flop that is Battleborn. 
which was trying to do was trying to do a bunch of things at once and had a terrible release window. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one was um, Lawbreakers. Do you think Lawbreakers had a lack of focus? I mean, wasn't it yep. pretty much we're a hero shooter, everyone's got different mobility modes, go? Like that type of thing? Or was there yes, more I, to it? Yes, I, I do I do I do think it I do think it had a um, I do think it had priority problems. Um mm. because of the fact that I I am honestly of the belief that hero shooters and arena shooters don't mix. Cliff Blazinski is somebody who made his name on on arena shooters with un, with Unreal Tournament and death and death matching therein. Mm-hmm. That th- and um up and and up until release, all of, all the press material seemed to indicate that was the approach that he that he wanted to do. He didn't seem to have any interest in doing a in doing the whole hero shooter with abilities kind of, kind of thing. Um, right, because. The the reason why I say that they don't mix is because they prioritize two different things. A arena shooter, you know, your, your quakes, your unreals, your halos to an extent. They prioritize understanding of the map and understanding where pickups are and what and what constitutes as the right weapon for certain occasions. Yes, really oh. focused on that. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it lives and di- it lives and dies by its by its map by its map design. Mm-hmm. Whereas a hero shooter is b- is based more on the is based is based more on the individual kits of he- of heroes and what what they can do and how you utilize the, how you utilize a kit that you already have from the get from the get go. And it's about the team meta mm-hmm. and. Uh, optimizing your alts yeah. and things like that, mm-hmm. which is what is why I find it funny that um that when um the when the when the when the team at Overwatch um claimed that they didn't intend to have a didn't intend to have a meta, I thought uh, <laughs> they probably they probably they probably honestly didn't, but at the but at the same time um nobody intends to have a meta, but it's going to happen no matter what. Yep. Yeah, that's true. It's <laughs> it's it's not it's just it's just a matter of how human nature is going to work. People are going to figure out exploits. They're going to figure out the best ways to do things, and there are certain things that are going to ri- that are going to rise up when people figure this out. Um, if you need an er- if you need an early exa- early example, I remember playing Tekken three growing up, and um, and everyone pi- everyone picking Eddie because he was fucking broken, or. Mm-hmm. The, or the fact that that's also that's also the reason why I mentioned that whole multi-role thing when it came to um, WoW classes. Eventually, eventually those ended up becoming the dominant fa- dominant factors, and um, single role classes less so. Yeah, hybrids are always tricky. Either they become, you know, the the, the worst of all evils, or the most diluted of each class that they're made up, or they're they're just godlike, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're tough. Yeah, they're really um, tough. I remember, I remember playing. I remember playing um, basic D and D, and my DM outright refused to let anyone play as elves because they got OP. Elves got OP. At at least what? in his opinion. Okay. Because we're talk we're talking elves right. in that in that race as class era. So you've got you've got you've got a character who who is who is good in who is good in fighting and. Has magic. Okay. Um. The at uh, the gish as the technical term is, but the the one of the bit one of the big pro, one of the one of the really confusing things that I saw with Lawbreakers because I I do want to make clear the beta that I played I really really liked there was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff in there that was really good, especially when it came especially when it came to the gravity mechanics. Like it really was a it really was a dance, mm-hmm. but for what? But for some reason, the full release did not have a ranked deathmatch mode. Ah, uh. and 
the thing is, it was it was trying to it was and trying they... to do um, arena shooter motifs with pickups and the like, but you can't do you can't do that and a hero shooter at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because if you have to do those pickups, that means you have to balance that out with all the kit of every kit of every character. Yeah, I mean, hero shooters have a combinatorial explosion problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, just by adding heroes with new abilities, and if you're and if you have too much map dependence, you can break maps. So, yeah. you know, you end up having looser maps, and it's not, and it's it's more about the, you know, the the situational combination of abilities mm-hmm. at any one time between the classes. Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes. That's 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 also the reason why I fell out of favor with um he, with hero shooters because I came to realize that maps were were going to be emphasized less compared to just adding more characters and mm-hmm. um I I remember and um the pro- the problem that happens when you add more characters is this means that there's more th- there's more things on the web that you need to balance so that so that the new kid on the block doesn't end up outclassing everybody until th- until a newer kid comes on to outclass everybody yeah i was originally very against the idea of of, of hero shooters it came up when we were making firefall mm-hmm. about making our classes more like you know we didn't have a hero shooter example but mm-hmm. more like dota or that type of thing yeah. and you know we probably would have made a lot of money that way uh, <laughs> but uh you know it just uh to me it was a i was always against it because it was an it was just a nightmare to balance yeah. and i was like you're, you're gonna run into this wall but i guess you know if we're talking about just what players really got excited about is they did get excited about the abilities they did yeah. get excited about having very flavorful kits for their their character instead of you just being a generic mm-hmm. dude, space marine running around yeah. grabbing whatever's off the shelf. So, um, say, you know, that I'd was a fundamental the, shift and I'd one that, that people the, really liked. I'd say that the one, the one quote-unquote hero shooter that, se- that seems to have skirted this problem f- to a degree is Siege. Hmm. Rainbow Six Siege? Mm-hmm. It, ha- you, it, def- it has, uh, it has really other problems, accurate? mind you. Yep. Mm-hmm. But... I think, but I think it, I think it manages to skirt the worst of the problem for two reasons. One, um, the is one is one is the fact that instead instead of basing it around um, around some around some sort of bastardization of the of the um, MMO Trinity, um, it in, you instead you instead ha, you instead have the st- you instead are picking based on the stats. First off, you have the fact that it's that. Rosters are split between attackers and defenders, um, and these are and these are swapped every round. Um, second, oh. is the is the fact that there's that around there's no respawning. So you right. you have these long stretches of quiet before these explosions of um, violence. And two, is the is the fact that when I when I look. I can look at just two stats and get a, and get a general idea about what I'm dealing with, um, and that and that is armor and speed. You're either gonna ha- you're either gonna have the two and twos, which are jack of all trades types, the um, three sp- the three and one speeds, which are the which are the speedy boys who are who are gonna be going going around the map a lot, mm-hmm. or you or you have the beefy one one three um, armors. Um, and in addition to that, you're still pick you're still picking out a primary, second, secondary, um, and um, get and ter- and tertiary item in a lo- in a loadout. Well, it's also I mean, time to kill is much shorter, and yes. the map the map and in your your movement is consists of looking around corners, getting sight lines. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it the map is very important, and you've got those asymmetric goals, and you know you have attacker mm-hmm. defender. Yeah. So. Uh, so I guess it's sort of like, you know what, Rainbow Six Siege, I guess you could call it a hero shooter in that each, you know, there's classes and each mm-hmm. class has, has unique, uh, abilities that they can do, even though they're realistically themed. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, that's interesting because Rainbow Six Siege, in, if you call it that, then that really is the Counter-Strike meets hero shooter hybrid that Valorant was trying to be. Right. Yeah. With, um, 
And to, to be honest, I did I did try a little bit of Valorant, and the big pro the big problem that putting aside the fact that the um, the arts the art style and the and the gameplay demands didn't quite seem to match, um, but moreover trying to utilize oh trying to utilize Overwatch or League style abilities and alts just didn't quite f it felt it felt like a kit bash. And as somebody who's messed around with models, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that term. Mm -hmm. You had on one hand you have the you have the ability setup, and on the other hand you have the Counter Strike style shop, and they don't seem to complement each other. It feels like there's this big. It feels like there's this um big there's this big wall between between the two, and the and they're just they're just in front of each other, but but one of them doesn't complement the other really. And yeah. I could easily see a means where where you could where you could do that where you, where um like any, somebody once asked me what would be an easy fix and I said make the power something you gotta buy so you'd have to choose between either buying buying more powers or bu or buying bet or buying better guns. Mm hmm. I can see that. And I think I think in doing instead of um instead of having people do both at the same time because. Ulti because ultimately, in that in that kind of um, conflict, the guns are gonna are gonna win out. And for me personally, it's a little too demanding of that of that extremely high twitch accuracy that I've never been fond of. Because I'm a I'm a filthy fucking casual. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you're right. And I think what they should have gone for, what Valorant should have gone for, is really leveraging what their their strengths are. Mm -hmm. Right? If you look at if you look at LOL. Their strengths are outrageous characters, incredible just characterizations mm -hmm. and visual design. And Valorant's so bland in comparison, you know, compared to that strength that they have. And they should have gone with just over the top characters that isn't a hardcore shooter, that yeah. isn't trying to graft hardcore shooter mechanics onto it. And you know, and they would have captured, I think, far more mm -hmm. of the of the league crowd and and would have uh, been a dominant shooter in the genre. You know, um, of course they're doing well, and yeah. I, I, they're not doing bad, but they're not killing Counter Strike, uh, which was their goal. It was very obvious their goal was to become the number one Counter Strike like mm -hmm. shooter out there with it, with a twist. But I think that they completely ignored mm -hmm. their strengths. That they went after, you know, a hybrid that nobody really asked for, and uh, and got stuck in this position of. Oh, well, we're successful, but it didn't reach the heights that we had originally planned. Yeah, for it. I um, as grim as this is, to, as grim as this is to say, I can't, I can't help but suspect that you're gonna, you're gonna see Riot talking less and less about about Valorant in the next two years. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, uh, well, they've got more games coming too, which is really frightening. They have they have like three in the they had three in the mix. There's a fighting game, and there's something else coming out too. It's just I know now as far now as far as I think of I think a fighting game was going to have as long as as long as they don't do any sort of bashing is going to have a bit more success. Um, but I want to say a bit because um, they prob they probably have the they probably had the worst timing with trying to, with trying to introduce a fighting game when. Because the thing about the fighting game scene right now is, up until uh, up until several years ago, Street Fighter was the Atlas holding up the fighting game scene. That's not really the case anymore. You don't have you don't have you don't really have one, you don't really have one dominant player holding holding up the scene anymore. What you have are a, what you have are a bunch of not quite as dominant players, but but um, a bunch of uh, a bunch of other games holding up the holding up the scene um, all at once. I'd say I'd mm -hmm. say the largest the largest one holding it up in that in that traditional sense would be Tekken. Um, okay. But but even even with that, there was the runaway success of Dragon Ball Fighters, which. Um, um, which which was one of those match made in heaven kind of moments. There's and there's been there's there's um there's been there's if it weren't for if it weren't for the fact that Nintendo can't write netcode worth a damn, I I'd put I'd put Smash in the list. But there's been plenty there's been 
there's been indies like Skullgirls and them's fighting herds getting pl getting play at Evo. Um, Mortal Com I know somebody might say Mortal. Why not? Why why not bring up Mortal Kombat? Mortal Kombat is um even is a case of spinning the hamster wheel. Like they don't they only really seem to be able to get traction whenever they put in some guest character as a DLC these days. Mm -hmm. But when it com when it comes to the action and the reason why they got dropped from Evo is frankly speaking the numbers weren't there compared to other games. Like Undernight in Birth was get was getting better numbers. Um for 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 um Evo and st and stuff like Grand Blue Fantasy versus and the like is also doing. I'd say I'd say the the last few years have really have really been a coming out party for Arc System Works especially. Who mm -hmm. has handled Dragon Ball Fighters, they handle Guilty Gear, they handle Blaze Blue and um and a and a bunch of other products. And because yeah. because of because of all these very strong contenders trying to st trying to step in trying to step into that medium when you're not when you're not a proven commodity in that scene is going to be an uphill battle. Yep. That's why I, I think I think that a fighting I think that a fighting game will play to their strengths when it comes to characterization, but I do think it's not going to be easy. especially if um it I'd say I'd say these I'd say one of the smart things that they could do for themselves, even though I'm not sure if they'd be willing to do it, is advertise that they're using GGPO netcode. Mm -hmm. Um, which there there was a big there was a big deal made when um when one of the previous Guilty Year games was updated to use that netcode, which was specifically designed for fighting game tournaments. Oh, they're using a rollback system. Mm -hmm. Shooters have used this for a while. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I just I just looked it up because I don't play fighting games, yeah. so or, or design them. So I'm looking at uh, at this. Yeah. For me, for me, it's a, I've I've certainly played. But I'm not going to say that I'm tournament level or anything. I and I'm I'm certainly not going to be kicking Ga Diego's ass anytime soon. But I but it's more of a case of examining where tr where things are going, so I can predict um where they might go. Mm -hmm. That's why. I th um, and as far and I know that Ru I know that Rune Terra has been the card game that they've worked on has been in, has been in talks, but I don't hear I don't hear a whole lot of discourse about it. And, yeah, it's been pretty quiet. Um, I do have to I do have to wonder I do have to wonder if part of the reason for that is that people are less willing to tr trust somebody else with do with doing a digital card game after after. Or rather, a unproven digital card game after what happened with Artifact. Yes. Yeah. Which um, that was disappointing. Artifact was going to be dead on arrival, no ma no matter what. And the the way the putting a, putting aside the fact that they had a tear that they had a terrible model of of doing an upfront payment for this sort of thing when all their competitors are free to play. Um. Mm -hmm. There also was no. There also was no. There also was um, no demand. Or what if they gave a war and nobody came? Mm hmm. But the big problem. The big problem that I had when I actually sat down to play the thing, compared to compared to now the the idea of going with three lanes, okay, it's a cute idea and I'm per I'm perfectly fine with doing that. It effectively mm -hmm. means that you're playing three matches at once. The problem is that because of how the how one of the laning phases works, combat is very hands off. Like you said, you it's kind of the same problem why um why people have why people have an issue with the combat in grand strategy games. Like you you set up all the you set up all these moves in advance and then you just watch it go, but you don't right. really have a whole there's not really a whole lot of avenues for counterplay. Mm hmm. Which is what, which is one of the main appeals when it comes to card games is is that is that whole back and forth. Yes. In, but instead, you have a case of setting up your move and then both people do their move at the same time. It's it's not as engaging. So you're saying that artifact, once the game was going 
there wasn't a lot of back and forth and outcomes were pretty much determined by earlier moves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are um one thing that I'm very big on in in games is the concept of reversals. Yes. The because I think I think there should be a rule that no matter how far ahead that you are, you're never safe. Somebody who knows what they're doing can turn the tables on you, and then you and then you end up with as long being as, ass end and ass end over tea kettle. Right, and as long as that's not completely feeling RNG. Mm-hmm. Then it feel then it feels good. It's yeah. like okay, I got I got outplayed. But like in the case of artifact, once once you set up your uh, monsters and, and effects, then the game randomly determines what direct what direction you're attacking. That's why I say that it's too hands off. Okay. And now it now as far now. It could it could be argued that this was that this was meant to replicate um, the laning approach with Dota, but I don't I don't agree with that. I re- I really think that if you wanted to replicate that, it's better to replicate that using some sort of momentum system, or mm-hmm. so, or some or some sort of soft barrier so that you can't put strong stuff. You have to carefully plan out the um, way that you the. Um, way that you put out your stronger and stronger stuff so it doesn't get obliterated by the equivalent of turrets. Okay. Um obviously obviously that's just that's just my take but but if the idea is if the idea is to have a have a have the MOBA like feel within a card game, it's technically possible but you do but you can't play things 100% straight. Cuz Different medium. Mm-hmm. Um. But when, but um, when it, and of course, um. The I'd say I'd say the other I one of the other big problems that Artifact had, that was really damning was trying to do the uh, was trying to replicate a secondary market like Magic has. It, oh. Except you can't really do that kind of that same secondary market in digital form. Hmm, that's always fraught with risk. I'll give you that. Um, a big a big part of it a a big a big reason why I think you why I think you can't is because of the fact that at the end of the day, in the, in this case, Valve would have some degree of control about how, about how the how the um what the what what pricing would end up being like if people were going to put stuff up on the market as opposed to when you're mm-hmm. buying mat when you're buying secondhand magic cards either from a digital either from a website or at your, or at your LGS yeah there's there's it's a it's a really free market and mm-hmm. there's no thumbs on the scale as it was what you're saying yeah and beca- because of that um so um some some car some cards are obviously going to going to have more rare um more and different rarities than others mhm and th- and that's that's generally the uh, that's that's because because of that you can have car- you can have cards that'll be that'll be hi- that'll be higher value with with time or cir- or circumstance um but with the secondary market that they were trying, it was basically a it was basically a DLC market in all but name, or a or any sort of any sort of in app store in app store in all in all but name. The only difference is that people could put stuff up there. Um, were there were there price controls or what was going on? I didn't have enough time to to look into that to to see. And the the other problem was. Um, Having having a buy in when it came to when it came to ranked or when it came to tournaments, instead of, instead of just being able to just go just go into those modes straight. Okay. Yeah, it was. It's really, it was really trying to be too much, huh? Yeah, it it's, was it's, trying to blend too many things, and that's that's a real risk. Yeah. Although, um. Now what? Now um, 
if I want, if I might, if you don't mind me shifting to the whole D and D Beyond thing, um, do you? Mm -hmm. sure. One thing, one thing I do, one one thing I I do want to ask is when you met when you mentioned that sort of manager, are you familiar at all with Hero Lab? Uh, where you can customize your figure and get it printed, that type of thing. No, or... that, no, that's Hero oh. Forge. The Hero Forge. Okay. No, I don't know Hero Lab. Hero, Hero Lab is one is one of the oldest um character character management applications, um, as and it's one that I'd I'd say it's got some similarities with D, with D and D Beyond, except um it doesn't do just D and D. In fact, it I've I've seen it done with Pathfinder. I've seen it done with multiple editions of D and D. I've seen it done with um Call of Cthulhu, Savage Worlds, and so on. Um. Mm -hmm. I'd say the only the only downside that it has is the fact that it's a P, is the fact that it's a PC only application. They don't have a um, they don't have a tablet version for it. And I do. Do you do you suppose that we're going that that more gaming companies are going to experiment with trying to do um, character management on ta on tablet apps in the future? I do. I think that you're going to see a lot more of that, especially since. You know, a lot of us are playing remote now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just with D and D Beyond and the Discord integration, it's just really nice to be able to um, have your character right there. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I I think that there is a there's a technological gap right now where you're not really um, you're not really seeing these companies. I mean, they, they have skills in tabletop and some of them have skills in web dev and mm -hmm. things, but everything still feels a little bit clunky. Like if you had like a real game dev company dive into that, I think you could see some, some really interesting stuff. Yeah. I think you could see some really rich applications that you, that you haven't seen before. It's, it certainly doesn't help matters that a lot, a lot of, even with, even with as, even with as popular as it is, um, I can't say that I'm that I'm a hundred percent satisfied with any virtual tabletop currently on the market. Each one of yeah. each one of them has has their own little um, quirks. Um, I'd say Roll Twenty and Fantasy Grounds are the ones that I'm the most confident in. One thing that I th one thing that I think ne that I think um that I've that I've been advocating for for years is the is the idea of of a kind of of a kind of universal index for games. Um, I get like the way the way I'd imagine it is you is, and I could easily see this being being a kind of being a kind of either DLC or some sort of integration. Because there, there's already some companies like Cubicle Seven where if you buy the physical version of their game, you get the digital copy for for free. And something I'd like to see is the, is integration with a, with a certain app where, say you say you get the basic say you get the you um get you get the app and you and you get the base you get the basic rules for, um, let's go let's go with, for this for the sake of argument on this let's go with Thirteenth Age because I've been playing Thirteenth Age a bit, a bit and it's um base it's basically everything I wanted Fifth Edition to be. Um, and th let's say in that, let's say in this situation, sometime later on, you get the expansion 13 true ways and you, and you, and, um, that, and that'll have a code to integrate the content of 13 true ways into this unified rule index for, bo for both players and GM. So no, cause the main re the main reason for doing this is that I'd want to do this is to utilize, um, current technology so that people don't so that people don't have to do a bunch of book flipping if somebody is using a specific spell oh yes um well i mean the the rule access stuff mm -hmm. is is important but the D, D beyond does try to do that with have you played with their discord integration no so you can just, you know, they've got a bot that runs in Discord, and if you own the rules, you can access their database of rules format from Discord just by typing, you know, rule 
and then the name of the rule, mm -hmm. right? And then it spits out a nice little card summary of the rule set. Is is that kind of what you're talking about, or? Um, I'd say I'd, that's kind that's kind of that's kind of the that's kind of the first step with it. But I don't mean just just rules, but also things like effects. So the so a given rule for say a, if someone needs to look up the a say an, say a feat or um or the or the rules for a, or the rules for a spell Th those would those would be in, those would be just as viable in this kind of thing um yeah mm -hmm. and you can do that you can do you can do rule you can do spell mm -hmm. you can do item and the whole database is available there in discord yeah. which what what there isn't a good solution for is sort of like that mapping experience you can't do that well from discord yeah, and I I don't I don't think I think the only way I could see myself doing that is is if we um is if we do te if we do um keyboard based mapping like we're all playing Zork again. Yeah. <laughs> and is that the deep is that the deepest of deep cuts that I've that I've made since you've known me of bring, bringing up Zork? No, I love Zork. <laughs> I have no problem with Zork. Yeah. Um or or if I want or if I want to get really if I want to get really deep into the deep lore, um, dungeon, you know, D U N G E N, which was, oh, which was a, which was a, was a unlicensed version of Zork that would let, that would later go multiplayer. And that's why we have, that's why we had muds. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, multi-user yeah. dungeon. Yeah. I used to play some muds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but when, but, and of course the um, I'd say the the big reason why I've been why I've why I le I've leaned towards Hero Lab and have been hesitant with um D and D Beyond is the vibe I get from D and D Beyond is that it wants me, it wants me to use only first party material. Yes, that's that is true, and um. I realize I realize it would be very a very difficult undertaking to do, but um, I do th I do think that I do think that there need that some some um, attention should should be given to the concept of house ruling or th or third party material because I have a very sneaking suspicion that you don't play entirely rules as written when you DM. Hmm. I don't have a lot of pre-written up house rules, but I will sort of make stuff up on the fly just for dramatic or gameplay convenience. Um, so I don't know if that counts. It can good enough for government work. Okay. Um when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to those kind of things, I think that I think that ha I think that um, most people, hell, even Gygax house ruled his own game. Um, yes, and he did. And um, rule zero exists for a reason. Mm -hmm. So because because of the, because of that, um, I think I think that I think that some room for 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 house rules should be in, and when it and um, if some and. It's de it's doubly so if somebody's running a non-standard um, campaign setting. Like if mm -hmm. I if I were if I were to run a Indian themed um, campaign, I'm gonna have to house rule the shit out of that. Like, mm -hmm. sim just sim just simply because there's there would be so there would be so many classes and archetypes and the like that just wouldn't be compatible. Um, which is also the reason why I roasted the dungeon a certain line in the dungeon master's guide for fifth edition under over an open flame. It was, uh, it was that it was that whole thing where they tr where they tried to claim that you could play that a samurai class would just be a reskinned paladin. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, to it to which I say, yeah. Except here here's the thing. How are you going to have? How are you going to have? A how are you going to have? D and D wants fighters to do sword and board. How are you going to do that in a culture that doesn't believe in shields? Yep. Um, and 
say, and say the say a a um a you're not going to have a whole lot of um crossover between a Shinto priest and a um and a cleric, or an, or even an onmyunji and a wizard. Spe especially especially given how the that whole that whole that whole style of um of wizard who's 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 locked up in a tower with all their books it's not really it's not really a thing in in a lot of in a lot of in a lot of japanese interpretations yep like i've i've read i've read the otogi zoshi a bunch of times and even though onmyunji have appeared in that and other tales they um they ha they are more they're more akin to a to a court magician than anything else yeah i think the the flavor is completely different and the rules have to go along mm -hmm. with that flavor i really believe that um you know the the best you can have a great game that's mm -hmm great because of its rules you can have a great game because it's great because of its flavor where the magic really happens is where the flavor is interwoven and, su and supported by the game rules yes. and i think that that is something to to strive for so yeah i mm -hmm. think that that is uh you know that's that's definitely something that's that's interesting mm -hmm. um also since since you shifting to max a bit um this is a, this is a question that I've asked some some of, some of my other um, friends who are friends in the temple who are mech fans. But where do you where do you draw the line between a mech and power armor and and um where do you where do you think um Ember fit, Ember's Omni frames fit in, fit into that paradigm? Oof. Well, you know that's that's a really interesting question mm -hmm. and a tough one that I've been trying to explore and answer myself. Uh, because we've been, you know, I've been, I don't know if you remember on Twitter when I was posting mech design after mm -hmm. mech design after mech design going, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. And people, I found that there is no best mech design and it falls into a couple of camps, right? Uh, one is definitely just give me power armor. And that to me means something that is, uh, it has to be around human size and it can either be bulky or slim but the idea is that it's a less of a vehicle and more of an enhancement to your character and the original firefall where where ember is is, is you know the spiritual successor of uh is definitely that exosuit power suit feeling mm -hmm. right where it's it's definitely your character and when I shifted to Max for Ember, there was a, a lot of Firefall fans that are very hesitant about that because they like that power suit feeling and they weren't all that excited about being, you know, um, in a mech unless the mech was big and they were fully encased. Mm -hmm. It was really weird, you know? So, you know, because we have exposed pilots in our mechs and there's also a... a a hard driver mode where you can play encased but um it, it's like either get, i think the camp is either just put me in power armor or put me in a mech and give me that vehicle feeling and there's in trying to blend those two i think it you know uh people tolerate it but they're not exactly excited about it they either want to be iron man or they want to be you know uh in a gundam or in or in a, in a jaeger yeah you know um and then you have another split between the people who love the super robot stuff. And I would say that even like old Gundam is a and new Gundam is actually a little bit more towards super robot, even though it broke the mold and was mm -hmm. sort of like, Hey, what if we had military mechs and they were more utilitarian? Um, it's still, if you look at the their shape language, it's still a little more super robot than it is, say, oh, Armored Core, mm -hmm. you know, or Titanfall. And so you've got that split between the the people who like those very, it's almost like piloting a Ferrari, right? A Gundam yeah. versus versus a tank. And and I think that where Armored Core and, and, and that vibe comes from is definitely, you know, I call it the tank analog. It's definitely, yeah. 
is definitely based on that. So, uh, you know, where do you draw the line? I think you got to pick. I think you got to pick. Um, I th- I think it um, I think it I think it ultimately comes down to what to something that would something that would fit the world that it's placed in. Like if mm-hmm. if you if you play if um if you took if you took the world that Armored Core is set in, but you placed the but you placed Getter Robo in it, it wouldn't fit. It would clash. Yeah, you've got these gritty, realistic city settings and everything mm-hmm. else, and there's, they're not very colorful. And yeah, and suddenly you put Getter Robo in there, and he sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Whereas if you whereas if you've got if you've got something that is is on the opposite end of things, the ve- the very br- the very bright end of end of the approach, and you and you put in um. You put in Gal Gygar, or, ra- or rather, if you put you take that and you put in say you put in say um, um White Glint. I'll you uh, that's a better that's mm-hmm. a better case than this, um. It's you're gonna have the same problem. You, it's, yeah, I think so. And given given the fa- given the fact that the that with something like Ember, the co- the core is is something is Mech versus Kaiju, um, very yep. very much very much in the, in that part in that particular vein. You're obviously not, you're obviously not leaning into the into the um hard, into the full on hard end of the spectrum. No, we're not. I mean, we're we're. It's 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 more. It's not full on super robot. It's not uh, Ultraman or Gridman. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but it's it it it's not. Uh, it's not that armored core tank analog. Yeah. And it's not that gritty realistic type of mech. No, these, the idea is that the mechs have you know they have kind of like a colorful personality. In mm-hmm. fact, the original goal even for firefall was we wanted the frames to feel like racing motorcycles we wanted you to feel like you know um uh akira and tetsuo and you know and 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 just that that actually makes a lot more sense because when when um i i think that a lot of mech fans don't aren't 100 percent willing to admit how much of an influence top gun was i think the I think the only ca- I think the only case that comes at, that comes close to admitting that fact is um, Stardust Memory, where you listen to oh. the opening theme of that and you and you real and you re- and you can't unhear the fact that this is trying to be a legally distinct version of Danger Zone. <laughs> but like you, you look at the um, you look at the way po- if you look at a lot of mech anime in the in seventies and eighties especially. And and how how they dress, how they act, and there's a very um, there's a very pilot Air Force style culture, um, one that was most definitely popularized through t- through Top Gun. Whether you know, you know, wear, wearing the jackets, jumpsuits, aviator shades, all that kind of stuff. Yep, that's a ve- that is a very um, that's a ve- that's a very Top Gun look at it. It's, it and it certainly doesn't hurt that. So that so many of the, so many of the pioneers put an emphasis on dogfighting to the point where it has its own pejorative, you know the, the you know the Macross missile circus. Yep. And because because of that, I think I think it's something that should that instead of trying to fight, it should be leaned into. So I can definitely see where you're coming from on that. Well, I'm glad you said that because I've been looking at uh refining the design of the max and you know we've we've released the design for the light and we haven't released a design for the heavy and um and you know i'm i'm looking at this wondering which way to go yeah. and i know and there's a lot of people pulling on me in different directions some people really like that you know uh very militarized look and you're right; it doesn't really fit our theme and world. And so I've always struggled with that. But you, just being here and talking to you sort of clarified that. I think you're right. I think you got to kind of go go all in one way, one direction or the other. And then there were recent talks about how we dress our pilots, mm-hmm. right? 
And, you know, originally it was very kind of militaristic and everyone wears a plug suit. But I was like, that wasn't the original idea. The original idea in Firefall and in Ember was to have sort of, you know, you could, it, these kids basically in street clothes hop into Mecca and, and go do their thing. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think you're right. I think in, in our earlier conversation about straddling genres in gameplay can apply to, to, aesthetics as well mm -hmm. and if i try to straddle that line at least in you know we're a game where we sell skins mm -hmm. maybe down the line you could get a military skin but you're asking what is the first impression of the game what is that you know and it's got to be unified and i think you're right i think we're we're definitely more towards that um you know um uh gundam super robot side than we are titanfall 2 there's there's one of there's one of the reason why I would that why I personally discourage the idea of leaning more into the military end of things, and it ties it ties in with a not something specific to lore, but the general idea, the idea that you're that you're that um you're using the you're using these to, um, extract resources to to build to build stuff and to defend and to defend what you've got. It's a very frontier claim, frontiersman claiming a stake kind of approach. Yes. Um, I'd hesitate to refer to it as Wild West, but there is definitely some DNA in that. And um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the Gate Striders are meant to have that sort of rugged individual. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of the Wild West meets uh, Robert A. Heinlein, you know, yeah. and his philosophies of Tanstolf and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, and because of that... Going with the traditional military approach doesn't qu doesn't quite work because if somebody's strike if somebody's <clears throat> effectively striking out in the fr in the frontier, um, that's not they they if it was if it was more militaristic they'd be bringing a lot more than just that. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. And uh, well, you know, one of the themes is that they they aren't a military, but they do get sort of loosely organized as the invasion, as they realize the the, the aliens are extremely dangerous, hostile, mm -hmm. and bad for not just Ember, but, you know, all of humanity. Um, they sort of, like, improvise something. That, you know, that and, leans more towards a militia, honestly. That does, yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, they're not a, you know, and... and this has been so helpful to pass because I've been dealing with this during the art refresh mm -hmm. that we're doing uh, leading up to Kickstarter and the novel, trying to pin down exactly what our vibe is because <clears throat> I think we were kind of push-pulled a little bit in, in a couple of different directions. And um, and going back to the original ideas behind, well, what was Firefall supposed to be and, you know, what and, and where do we end up? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that uh, mechs with personality, uh, you know that type of uh, you know okay you can have personality too titanfall 2 you know a lot mm -hmm. of personality in that yeah. mech, right bt um but I, I guess i mean in terms of like the flavor of the of the uh of the of the mecca themselves and i've also been thinking about you know i try to get the light frame as small around the player as possible because mm -hmm. i really believe that if you want to like really engage people in the mecha genre you've got to have characters at yeah. some point and it can't just be about um, cool robots running around because while I get that and I'm totally into that, most of humanity, most of gamers want to identify with the pilot, want to mm -hmm. identify with the character. And so the light frame is really designed to be really tight around the character so that it feels more like an exosuit and closer to Firefall than the medium and the heavy frame. And then the heavy frame would be at the other end of the spectrum where it is, it feels like 100% mecha, yeah. you know? And and the move system might actually be different between the two, uh, between the three. So, mm -hmm. you know, the I'm, I'm playing with the idea that the heavy mech, uh, it, it, it doesn't walk around, it, it skates around, right? Sort of like Armored Core does. And... Uh, I, I probably... will admit that when you mentioned heavy mech, the I immediately started making um, Steiner Scout Lance jokes in my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, 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 the idea would be that you know we give them a move set that's 
you could almost play with dual joysticks. If you had a Hotas, you know, dual joystick set up, then you, you would feel at home playing the heavy mech that way. But if you're playing the light, then you really want that ASWD keyboard and mouse feeling, yeah. right? So I think that's what you're going to see from us. And I think, you know, after, after this speaking with you today, it's definitely cemented in my mind that, okay, I should just embrace the default the default skins and other Macs and everything else should be along the lines of those more flavorful uh, and less militaristic designs. Sort of like the way the Thumper is now. The mm -hmm. Thumper, he's you know he's got a ridiculously cartoony drill, right? Yeah. And he's got a faceplate with emojis, uh, and 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 I like him. He's cool, but he's definitely more along that super robot genre than BT from Titanfall Two. Yeah. And what and. Going further into that, you you mentioned you given how you mentioned one of the inspirations you had was um was was like was like racing vehicles. Yeah, I think I think you hit I think you hit on something, but I want I want to push that a little bit further, and that and that is the subculture around around things like say street racing, how ev yep. how everybody especially since you remarked about sell about selling skins, and how. You look at you look at you look at those those sort of underground cultures, whether it be street racing, whether it be whether it be punk and rock and rock scenes, or uh, any or any other scene with a DIY undercurrent. And yep. you'll look at those and you'll see, like they'll have they'll have they'll have their own little they'll have their own little customizations, doing as much personalizations as possible, whether it be in the kit. Whether it be in just de whether it be in just decals or or something or what or some combination of the two, sometimes in sometimes in the way that in the way that somebody dresses or or the like, and it ha it's a very superhero costume kind of thing. Like you look you you um you can look at, you can look at these kind of things and imme and immediately infer and immediately infer some things, like how much like how I can do a. I can do a minimalist re drawing using just red and blue pencils, and I can immediately put Superman in someone's head, even if it do even if it doesn't look anything like it. Yes. Um. I remember I remember once somebody did the these sets of minimalist drawings on Marvel characters, where it was it was just a um it was just a rectangle that had that had that had um that had straight um blocks of color, and you could instantly look at those at those pictures and you say that's that's iron man that's Wol that's wolverine and so and so on yep and let and um since you mentioned since you mentioned akira i'll um, i'll point out cons consider consider the famous bike like yes. you look at the detail in the bike and you've got, and you've got and it's got stickers all over the place and it it kind of it kind of ties back into into that motif. And I think I think oh, yeah. leaning into into that is If you look at our first concept art for Ember, it was the Thumper and he had racing stickers over him because yeah. the Gate Striders they they weren't militaristic. They were sponsored by corporations to go sort of like um cuz they were the only ones crazy enough to go through D gates to explore unknown sectors of space, mm -hmm. right? And I guess, you know, when I later saw the Expanse, uh, you know, when they have the slingshot racers and the guy who's trying to go through the gate and he gets, mm -hmm. I don't know if you follow it at all. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's that kind of attitude. And, you know, that street culture has got to, you know, has got to be portrayed in the game and then the Kickstarter movie. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something that I definitely want to get back to. And it, and it even comes back to our character designs. You know, why do we have guys that look like they do why do we have uh, women that look uh, look like they do is because well it's it's fast and furious more than you know uh call of duty mm -hmm. right so people are a little more exaggerated a little over the top and uh and they're going to be wearing street clothes and you know not just plug suits all the time and these are uh, and it's like Top Gun pilots in their off time yeah, yeah. it's it's totally the way I keep describing it but we've yet to I think uniformly capture it in the presentation of the game mm -hmm. so that's part of what the art rework is about and also part of what the um um uh, you know um the themes of of uh, are, are are going to be what are we going to present yeah. in the trailer mm -hmm. i'd say i'd say um 
Given 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 that Fast and Furious um, comparison, I'd I'd say what I'd say that um the whole that the whole concept of being a gate strider is is going to it would you say it would have an undercurrent of these are people who live life on the edge? Oh, absolutely. You you can't be a gate strider unless you're a super risk taker. Uh, that's that's their whole ethos, right? Yeah. And um, and and then they they took it too far and they lost their planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now they're here on Ember, trying to find a new home and and sort of carving it out. But yeah, I think that even comes down to the UI. If you think about how the UI was is or is for the Fast and Furious games, you know, uh, or just even like the title sequence for mm-hmm. uh, uh, for 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 these movies, you know, it, it's it's got to come down to the vibe and. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that that's all got to tie together and I'm kind of excited now because it's like, you know, that would be really cool. And that's what I wanted to do originally. And, and you help reinforce that. Yeah. And, just by talking. and for, for what it's worth, um, when it comes, when it comes to, when it comes to create, when it comes to crazy ass ra- racing games, um, the big one that will, will always come to mind for me is burnout. Yeah. And when you look at how, when you look at how burnout presents itself, it is very case high risk, high in, high insanity. Um, shit, shit is go, shit is going to go bad for some for somebody at some point, and it, and eventually it'll be eventually it'll be you. But you're not but you're not going to be mad about it because because um he because there's going to be a whole lot of car wrecking. Um, mm-hmm. You know it's kind. Of, it's 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 a more up it's a more upfront version of the meme that spit that's been around for years about Mario Kart about how that game ends friendships. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. to, to the point where I um, okay, a bit of a a bit of a a bit of a side note. I as a as a bit of a as a bit of a prank once I um, I bought a friend of mine a plush version of the blue shell just to, just to haunt, just to haunt him. Okay. <laughs> It was it was mainly because he had, he was in a race once and he was inches away from the finish line on the last lap and he gets blue shelled. Oh no! And that, so you, and right so being the great race, friend that you are, <laughs> look, I'm not trying to hit a man while he's down. I'm trying to kick him because that's easier. <laughs> You, yeah, but you you look at some something like that, especially with them um, takedown and revenge, which are two which are two of the best games in that series. It it has it has that um, very uh, very on the edge. These these are people who are who are absolutely nuts um, kind of approach. Um, you have you and I and obvious obviously I'm I'm not saying go that far go that far in with when it comes to Ember. I'm just using that as. An example for that whole life on the edge thing, because even if the, I'd I'd say it'd be fair that even if gate striders are are cut off from their home world, old habits still die hard. Mm-hmm. Like even if they're even if they're trying to make something of this new world, they are there's st- there's still the fact that that whole that whole on the edge attitude is still going to be a part of them. Oh yeah, they're adrenaline junkies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because and because of because of that, I now when it comes, I'm not saying get I'm not saying get rid of so, uh, something like plug suits. What mm-hmm. I what I am, but what I will say instead is, um, people will find some way to customize pl- to find cu- ways to customize plug suits too. Even if you, it, you even if it means easily... making them look like um look look like the kind of outfits you'd you'd see it you'd see outside of a racetrack. Oh yeah, I mean you could sticker them up. You could you know you could do all sorts of stuff mm-hmm. to them, and you know there's there's two founder G suits. Our plug suits are called G suits, mm-hmm. and then uh, there's a handful of skins. But you know if you look at our we recently put up a survey for new male outfit designs, mm-hmm. and you know they're they're much more street oriented. And I know that like my son was instantly more excited about that than any sort of, you know, uh, plug suit design. Cause for him, he wanted to express his individuality. He immediately wanted the, the one with the hoodie with the, 
metal shoulder plate and the racing stripes on it you know he was uh so i think that's the way to go and thank you for helping me cement that mm -hmm. in my mind and uh because you're you're you know i I've, I've written this stuff down but you forget because i wrote it down for firefall I wrote it down in the beginning of Ember, and then you know you 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 start modeling stuff, and you're in development, and you get kind of lost a little bit in the weeds as you're working on mechanics mm -hmm. and things like this, and you forget uh, vibe is important, right? Earlier in the podcast, we talked about you got games that are great for gameplay, mm -hmm. you got games that are great for vibe, but the gameplay is uh, well, we forgive it because the style is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. If you confuse the two, then you have something truly special and yeah. that's what i'd like to go for i'd like to go for where the rule set and the and the world ip knit together i think mm -hmm. that's really that's really something you should aim for and if you hit it you're, you're going to do really well and uh or you're going to land stronger in one area or the other and that might be strong enough to carry you too but yep. the magic happens when the two meet mm -hmm. and it's because it's because i'd say um as as weird as weird as it is when it comes when it comes to this whole emphasis on style, the the thing that the thing that keeps yelling in my ear is is the um is the style emphasis with something like say Devil May Cry. Yeah, a for a franchise that I love to pieces and have loved since since I first since I first played a demo that I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> I beat the first and the second, I think, and then I, I stopped playing them. I don't know um, why. Sec nobody the second is is in the halls of we don't talk about that. That's probably why I stopped playing the series. Um, yeah. Third third on third onward were 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 proper were proper returns to form. Um obviously ex obviously except that um one that Ninja Theory made that ha that um I could that I could cheese ridiculously. Um but that's also in the hall of we don't talk about that. You know, mm -hmm. like you know, it's in for what it's worth I keep L five R second edition in that same hall. <laughs> Again, trying to mix oil and water. It's not happening. Um <laughs> But yeah, that's that's ki that's kind of the that's kind of the vibe that, that I see, especially since when you I um I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy fourteen. And I I actually find it very impressive what um Yoshi P had done with a game that was all but on the, all but on his death's door until he came in and just blew and just blew the thing up and restarted. Yep. And there is there there is a there is a full on subculture within that game's fan base of of people showing of people showing off um their their favorite outfits or their favorite G poses, especially on the PC end, because obviously people can mod things. Um, and the and the same the same applies with cert, with certain um, outfits and visual designs in um, in in say Skyrim, because well, it's e it's easy to it's easy to fix what's already broken. Mm -hmm. Look, the Elder Scrolls has been my whipping boy since since uh, since Arena. That's not stopping anytime soon. Um, right. But when, but that's that's also the reason. That's also the reason why. Um, I know some. I know some people like to do the whole. It's just. It's just cosmet. It's just cosmetic as a defense for. Um, be, for bad. Um, MTX. What they're not taking into account is that for some people, those cosmetics are part of the appeal. That the whole the whole idea of get of getting together the best look that you that you can think of. Mm -hmm. Um. That's I'd say even I'd say even um. I'd say even um old, even cer even certain um, PC RPGs had had that kind of thing because every, every, there would always be the, there would always be those kind of people who boasted about their gear loadouts with um Diablo two in my experience. Yes. Um, du doubly so, if, doubly so if they were a caster for some reason, and r although I might be a bit biased because um, original or because I was because I would um, I would I would either be doing Amazon or Assassin the majority of the time I was playing. 
Good classes. <laughs> um, well, of course, I'd go with martial arts builds with assassin simply because I got to work my damn gimmick. Mm-hmm. But even but even with even with all that, the the it's one of the it's one of those things where it's, where it definitely ha- where it would definitely require that lean into that because when I think about the when I think about the idea of putting in the military end of end of things, like I can under I can understand the appeal. But when I try and put that within the context of Ember's lore, it starts to clash. Yeah, and it's, it starts to feel less like it starts to feel less like a world and more like a caricature. Mm-hmm. Um, now, some sometimes you can have that juxtaposition and make and make it work. Um, two examples I can think of are, for one, Zone of the Enders, where. There's a very clear di- there's a very clear power difference between orbital frames and LEVs. Mm-hmm. Um, much li- much like how there was that vast power difference between the Gundam and all the Zaku series. Right. Um. The other one is is um Full Metal Panic, where you have a, where you have a large amount of the me- mech that are very grounded. But then you have a mech like, say, the Arbalest that ha- that has borderline supernatural effects. Yes. Mm-hmm. But the thing the thing is is that is that it's is that in that sort of in that sort of thing it still it's you still have to have something that grounds it so that the so that when that grounding is bent, um, the audience isn't going to question it. Yeah. That suspension of disbelief mm-hmm. has to be respected. Yeah, um, this goes all the way back to some to something like say Star Trek, where the only person who had mental powers was the one person who wasn't human. Mm-hmm. And at the sa- at the same time, if you don't if you don't have that foundation, then it's then it's really hard to make the parts that are supposed to break the the intended foundation. Um, not fe- not feel as important. It just feels like an- it just feels like another another bag of spice. To put it to put it one way. Yep. And you know, uh, yeah, you got me thinking even more. It's like I think that I haven't really seen a mecha game that plays to this this type of flavor. You know, um, you have plenty of the. I think. Um, I don't know if I if I if you look at uh, hmm, if you look at Armored Core, you know that has a very very much this vibe. And then I'm thinking, well, what 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 game would have this sort of vibe? And I'm very hard pressed to think of one that that does do that. Where uh, what we're trying to do? Yeah, um, I'd say I'd say the closest one that I can think of, and this is, and I am stretching this so hard, I may as well be Reed Richards. Um, <laughs> is mass builder? Yeah, that I mean that definitely has the. Uh, that has that has a very Gundam flavor. You know, here's your inner mm-hmm. frame. Here's the pieces that go on top of it. Yeah. It's got it's Gundam builders. You know, um, and uh, and but it it has no people element really. You know, you've got the little pop up anime characters mm-hmm. that talk to you but yeah. uh but I don't I don't think it's it's really got that people centered vibe. It's about your mass builder, mm-hmm. it's not about your pilots. Yeah. Um it's it def, it definitely is it definitely is a tr- a tricky a tricky situation especially since the argument could be made about why why fo- why focus that much on the pilot when you're when gameplay is going to revolve around the mech. Is an argument I, is an argument I can see a, a designer making. Yeah, I'm not advancing that argument personally. I'm just see I'm just seeing that potential argument. Um. When but when it comes to when it comes to set when it comes to um stri- when it comes to striking that per- that particular um ba- when it comes to striking that particular approach. The the ones that w- the ones that would are pretty few are pretty few and far, are pretty few and far between, um, 
largely because of the largely because of the fact that they have that argument and they don't question it, which I think I think is one of those one of those issues. Um, you've probably know, you've probably known by now, but I have I have made a I have made a bit of a career of thumbing my nose at um, at traditionalists. Okay. Especially, especially within the role playing scene, and the reason why I do that is, I find that a lot of people use tradition like dogma. They they do they do it because that's the way it's quote unquote supposed to be done, but they never ask why it's um, established that way. And because of the fact that they don't that they don't ask why, they end up um, bottlenecking what they can do. Now, in some in some cases, understandable. You're not gonna you're not gonna mess with you're not gonna be able to mess with the with the um, paradigm if you're making something directly based off the Gundam IP. Like you're gonna be answerable right. you're gonna be answerable to um, Sunrise in that regard. But if you're making your own thing, that's a little less that's a little less the case. And. I'm looking through the through the um, mech games that I ha- that I have on um, PC. Yep. Um, a lot of them. I'd say I'd say the the only one I can think of that might come close because because of how its gameplay works is um, hardcore mecha, since in that one you do have um, not since you do have non mech sections within that. And the idea of being able to eject or ju- or jump in someone else's mech, um, but the majority of the ones that I ha- that I that I have in front of me, the emphasis is still very much on the mech and not on, and not on the not on doing anything with the pilot. Um, yep. There, okay, I, t- I tell a partial lie because of course there is um, Titanfall two. Yes, that's that's arguably a yeah. Yeah, that that's an interesting mix. So it's, and, uh, but still very much. It does focus on the pilot, but it's still maybe even you could say it's actually a pilot game and with mechs, you know. <laughs> and uh, but it has that. It definitely has that very militaristic, uh, you know, vibe to it. It's yeah. all about being militaristic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Um, I'd say. Um, if I now, if I wanted to be a smartass, I could bring up Metal Wolf Chaos. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that's got a funkier vibe. Yeah, it's it, over the top. It's like Earth Defense Force. Yeah, it's um, it's one of the it's one of those things where you couldn't re- where you couldn't believe that the same people who would make Dark Souls would make that. <laughs> um. Then again, then again, then again, these are these are the same people who also who also made one of one of my one of my favorite um, action games on the original Xbox, Otogi. Oh, I haven't played that. Otogi is not as good as Ninja Gaiden. I will clarify that. But you know how we said that you can get away with a lot if you if you've got a really good if you've got a really good visual identity. Mm-hmm. Otogi is an example of that. Both, both it, both the original game and its um, sequel. Okay. And because of because of because of that, it 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 ended up having a very strong impression to me to the point that my first um, my first avatar art when I the one with the one where in the um hall with all the statues I I made sure to have Ry- the main character Raiko in that. Um, but when it when it comes to when it comes to this particular approach of in of integra- of going a little bit more in the super robot end, uh, I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, even even the ones that are leaning a little bit more in the super robot end, there's ne- there's not a, there's not a whole lot of emphasis on the pilot. I mean. I guess if I wanted to stretch things, I could bring up Zone of the Enders, especially um, the second runner, or mm-hmm. Zone of the Enders Anubis for the for you we for you weeaboos out there. <laughs> um, or, mm-hmm. well, look at where anime's headed. I mean, <clears throat> you know, Darling the Friends is very 
individualistic. Yeah. <clears throat> Even though they're 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 not I mean they're they're supposed to be military, I guess, you know, but they're but they're they're not, right? Like every every mech design is completely unique. Uh they're they're a bunch of kids and um you know and and um it's definitely not it doesn't have that military mecha vibe to it and it's, it's and the designs are really over the top um i don't know if i'd go that far super robot you know but mm -hmm. uh um but yeah i think the idea is that we're gonna have <clears throat> we're gonna have more of a, a mm -hmm. street culture feel to this yeah like the gate the gate striders are, are not a military unit yeah um I think I think in, I think the easy way to 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 circum to circumvent in some regards, and this brings me to Full Metal Panic, is um, even though even though even though the primary organization Mithril um has 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 some skeletons has some skeletons of of be, of, um, of a militaristic um hierarchy, um they're in they're for all intents and purposes mercenaries with a large budget. Yes, like. Uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, when you're done with this point, I'm going to bring up another one that dovetails with that. Um, I, go right ahead on that. Well, okay. So when I was young, I, I was a big Chris Roberts fan, and mm -hmm. I played tons of Wing Commander. Mm -hmm. I could not wait for Strike Commander to come out because I wanted to be. And Strike Commander was a game where you were a you were not the military, but you were a bunch of mercs. And you had your own F-16s and everything else, and you would you you could personalize them, and you'd go out on missions on behalf of governments where mm -hmm. they couldn't go, you know. And that's that was like an early inspiration for Firefall themes and and Ember themes is that is is really Strike Commander, which unfortunately when it came out was just. It, it couldn't run on any machine. It was like the crisis of its day, right? <laughs> and um, and but that flavor of yeah, we've got we've got these these very powerful weapons, but we're not part of the military. We're we're extra military. We're outside of the jurisdiction of the military. Mm -hmm. You know that is that's that's always been, you know, I I think the theme that I've wanted to tie into. So Full Metal Panic. That's a similar thing. Mithril is a mercenary outside of the government and and uh, military jurisdiction, you know, entity. Yeah, and this that's not this that's not um, of course, it, and that also ties into that whole to that whole um, Wild West thing because the reason why you'd have an organization like that is simply because there's bigger fish out there. Name yep. Namely, namely, all of the kaiju who want, who want to see everybody living on, want to see everybody living who's not them, um, not living. Yep. <laughs> um, I've seen I've seen some people bring bring up the bring of the pilot and mech relationship in Lancer. Um, Lance Lancer would be too weird for what you're shooting for. I'm just gonna. I'm is just that gonna a game or an anime? I don't. Um, I've never heard. Of it. Lancer is a tabletop RPG that's um that's gotten a lot of traction, especially especially among people who like bringing tabletop and mecha together. I reviewed it a few months back. Um, I do like. I do really like Lancer, and it's a very. It describes itself as a very mud and lasers kind of game, but the design. Oh, they, they had a huge Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I just looked it up. But the design of the design of the mechs and the and the design of the mech pilots is a little bit too out there for what you're shooting for. Is Lancer uh, their first game? Yes, but um, it's co it's um co-creator had previously done a web comic called Kill Six Billion Demons. Ah, uh, okay. Um. Well, now I want to get the rule book for Lancer. Yeah. Is it out? Yeah, it's out. I've I've had I've had I've had the digital version for a while. The um, PDF is uh, in an on the way kind kind of approach. They also have one of the they also have one of the best the um, CompCon um, char um, character creator is one of the best I've ever seen. What's the CompCon character? That's their system. Um, Originally, originally it was a uh, fan, it was a fan made app to have a character creator and character management. 
Um, but I guess Massive Press liked it so much they decided to make it the official one. Oh, okay. So and the and the rest was um, history. And like like I said, a few months back I did I did review it. It's it's over. It's definitely got its quirks. Um, I'd say the, I'd say the big. I'd say the uh, big the big thing that's interesting about that one is that um, buying buying a mech is buying a mech is easy. It's getting the license to actually use it. That's where the hard part is because in the setting they can literally three D print mechs. But since they don't want just anybody using these, they'd rather have they'd rather have it where where the mech is actually going to come back. Um, as you develop, you get licenses for mechs. That Got it. that authorize you to have to have a give to have a given one. Um, oh, they're not on they're not on drive through RPG. Um, they they are. I think they're on itch.io. Yeah, they they're totally bucking the system, huh? Um. Well, there's some other uh, there, there's some disagreements that I have that I have with them. I'll um that's a, that's a uh, that's a that's a whole other story. But with uh, um with all that said, I'm def I'm definitely gonna be looking forward to how to how um to how Ember is gonna develop, and I'm glad that I was able to help out with kind of cementing the vi the visual style that you want to go for. Cause yeah, that I'd, was very helpful. Because I say once you've got that down, then everything else just kind of um, flows down like a waterfall. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, and again, th I can't thank you enough for for always for always being open to come onto my little show and enjoy the insanity that that comes down here. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, yeah. and uh, and yeah, we talked about a lot of things. So thank you for having me again. I think this was even uh, is it, even more fun than last time. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, last time, last time, last time I was trying to be somewhat serious. This time I'm not. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I just, you know, mm -hmm. we can, we can, we can have more beer next time or something. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely keep. Look, look, event, eventually, eventually, every, eventually, everybody's panic demic status will pass, and I'll, pr and I'll probably end up finding myself in California again. Oh no! Don't come back. <laughs> oh, all right, Mojo. Thank you very much for my, having me again. My pleasure. And uh, and yeah, mm -hmm. and 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 thank you for the uh, you know helping me cement the uh, idea of Ember fully in my mind, going back to my roots. Mm -hmm. Really, <laughs> awesome. Yep. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes to everybody who who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty yep. more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>